Health, the beating heart of your every day. It's in every step of your journey. We are there with you because caring for your health is at the heart of everything we do. We collaborate with scientists, researchers, and hospitals to support doctors, surgeons, nurses, and caregivers across the world to give you the best possible solutions to improve your health. Innovation and you, Philips. Welcome everybody, I'm Tina Brown and uh, you know, I think watching that video we should all feel shocked and ashamed, really shocked and ashamed and clearly there is a conversation not happening in America at the moment of something so important to all of our lives and it's thrilling actually to be able to have that conversation here in, in, in depth with people who really know what they're talking about on the issue. and. Uh, Joining me now is a woman who very much knows that, uh, Dr. Natalie Hernandez. Uh, she's one of our country's leading public health experts in maternal health. She co-founded and serves as executive director of the Center for Maternal Health Equity at the Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, which by the way was recently recognized as the top institution in the US medical schools for its social mission. And she's here to enlighten us. Um, I really just can't believe that it's actually safer to have a baby in Tajikistan than it is in the United States of America, this powerful, affluent country. So can you just tell us you know, what is going on? Ooh. Tina, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot going on. It's, you know, it's really a multifaceted issue. But you know, particularly when it comes to inequities, a lot of it has been really rooted in American history and in the fabric of our country's founding in you know, structural and systemic racism. When it comes, when you see maternal mortality rates for black women being three to four times likely to die from pregnancy related complications. I mean, it really is something that's shocking, but that has existed for a long time. We're just grateful for really great community-based organizations that have really amplified this issue to be mainstream and for us to be able to have this conversation on Washington Post Live today. Well, I mean, it, you know, I, I guess uh, to me it's incredible. We obviously understand the history, mm -hmm. but the fact that it's continued, yeah. the fact that it is where we are now. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is also that the vast majority of these maternal deaths are actually preventable, right? Yes, yes. Um, there have been reports that, you know, between 80 and 90 percent are preventable. I know in the state of Georgia, which has one of the highest maternal mortality rates, um, our preventability on some conditions was almost 100 um, percent. And so we have um, some serious things to think about, right? I think oftentimes when we look at these issues, we want to treat them when we really need to be thinking about, okay, how do we intervene in meaningful ways before people even get pregnant? because we're trying to resolve an issue of maternal mortality within a nine to 10 month span when this is something that happens as soon as a person is birthed into life. You know, your, your clock begins then, you know, the weathering, the chronic stress, all of these things that contribute to maternal mortality are happening, but we're wanting to treat it all in nine months. So, I mean, are these deaths really happening because of the protracted absence of care throughout the entire pregnancy? That's a, a little bit of it, right? I mean, you know, there's prenatal care, but then we still in our country have a lot of women and birthing people that don't have access to reproductive health care. 
um, in the state of Georgia, about 20% of women of reproductive age do not have access to care. And that's, I mean, in one of the richest countries, and I talk about this all the time, in an incredible healthcare system, that's unconscionable. Everyone should be able to access the care that they need in the ways that they need it. It's incredible. Um, I mean, actually, there are many women in America. Can you hear me all right, by the way? Yeah. Yes, right. There are a lot of American women today now who are living in what's known as a maternal health care desert. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? Uh, so explain how, 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 that, you know, how that has happened. Yeah, I mean, you know, particularly in the South, there are a lot of states that didn't expand Medicaid. And so we have, you know, a lot of rural areas that don't have any type of obstetrician or gynecologist or hospital systems that are equipped to deal with a lot of trauma. Um, again, I give a lot of, you know, facts from Georgia because that's where I live and breathe and, and do my work. Um, but, you know, we've had a lot of hospital closures. Um, we don't have enough people being trained in obstetrics and gynecology. And again, particularly when it comes to inequities, people that look like us, um, that can provide respectful care, that understand and have those lived experiences. And I mean, how has the Dobbs decision impacted all of us? Well, you know, we have seen some correlations and where states that have the most restrictive abortion laws also have the highest maternal mortality rates. And, you know, we're at a critical time where with this decision, you know, we can see a lot of adverse maternal health outcomes come out of it, particularly for underserved communities like black and brown communities or rural communities. And again, rural, you know, communities in the Southeast, which, which has this legacy in history of racism. Um, and so I think with the Dobbs decision, we just need to be really innovative. And that's what we're trying to do, right? We don't have time to just dwell on it. We need to move forward because we have people's lives at stake that are relying on us to take us um, to the next level. All right, well, I mean, I think that some people wrongly assume uh, that it's only very poor women uh, of color who are impacted by this whole maternal health care, uh, you know, deprivation mm -hmm. or no care at all. Yeah. But actually, of course, we mustn't forget the uh, Olympic gold medalist, Tori Bowie, who mm -hmm. it was a tragic case. Uh, she was the fastest woman in the world, and in May, eight months pregnant, age 32, she, she died from complications of childbirth. Yeah. And we've heard the story of Serena Williams. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the most powerful, famous, respected woman, you know, woman of color on the planet, really. Um, she couldn't get her medical team to believe her mm -hmm. about some of her scary symptoms. Can you remind us of, of yeah. what happened there? Yeah, so, you know, when it, when it comes to factors that are usually protective for women when it comes to maternal mortality rates, like, you know, women who have higher incomes, higher levels of education, we know for black and brown women, that's not the case. A black woman who has or graduated from college still has worse health, maternal health outcomes than a white woman who dropped out of high school. And so there are spaces where when we're trying to receive care that are unsafe and where we don't feel heard. You know, at Morehouse School of Medicine, we conducted a study um, with 100 women across the country um, with women who nearly died from pregnancy-related complications. And the biggest thing we heard was that they weren't heard. They felt discriminated against. And normally you hear like discrimination because of your race, but also discrimination because you're on Medicaid or the type of insurance that you have. And so, you know, we have a long way to go, but I know that, you know, a lot of this is systemic. And in order to really achieve maternal health equity, we can create the best medical interventions. We can do the most amazing programs, but if we don't change systems, we're, we're just putting band-aids on a very difficult and multifaceted issue. So is the major thing to, to make sure that you have more people of color in, in medicine? That's just one thing, because there's no way we can train up enough physicians of color, right? And I think that's the beauty, I mean, for Morehouse School of Medicine being a historically black medical college, you know, we, along with three other medical schools, produce up to 85% of the physician workforce that's people of color compared to the top 10 medical schools in the country. Oh, um, and so we have a role to play. But diversity can make a difference. We've seen with research studies that when a patient is treated by a provider that looks like them, they do have better outcomes. And we saw that with um, you know, premature births, particularly with black women. 
but it, it's going to take more than that, right? Because it's not just about physicians. You have whole clinical care teams. You have midwives. You have you know support persons like doulas. Um, you have patient navigators, community health workers. It's going to take all of us to solve this issue, and that's just at the clinical level. Then we need to really change and think about these what we call social determinants of health, where you work, live, play, breathe, and pray can have an effect on your health outcomes, and that's actually more of what contributes to a lot of the inequities that we see. Um, and so it, it's, like I said, it, it's you know when when I think about well, what do, what do I want to achieve? It's this hairy audacious goal and it's going to take all of us to be bold and stand up for what's right for our communities um, and it's going to have to be at every level. Well of course you also have a, a very personal connection to yes. this, right? I yes. mean you're a mother of two. I'm a mother of two. And it wasn't easy, right? Yeah, it, yeah. so I'm a mother of two. I grew up in the South Bronx um, where, you know, I did, I mean we are in an area where you witness a lot of inequities where you know, if you want to talk about experiencing social determinants of health, the South Bronx is that, right? It's one of the poorest counties in the country. But, you know, I am a PhD level educated woman. Um, and with my two pregnancies, you know, vast experiences on where I gave birth in Atlanta. Um, and then also suffered from postpartum depression. And you know, having that experience, not understanding, you know, everyone loves us when we're pregnant. Everyone loves you. And then when you're in that postpartum period, you're left alone, you're feeling isolated. And a lot of us don't understand what mental health complications look like or what does it feel like until you experience it and you're isolated. And so it was a, a traumatic experience and I wouldn't wish it on anyone else, right? Because you. I did see the effects that it, it, it can have on your children. Um, thankfully, you know, I, I, I do have support systems, but it was hard. And, and it's not just my story. There are so many stories of women that experience this. You know, I was talking to you earlier, and one of our maternal near miss stories, you know, there was one woman who she gave birth 10 years ago, almost died, was in a coma for 10 days. And, you know, when she, goes home from work, she actually drives an extra 10 to 15 miles to avoid the hospital that she saw that she had given birth in and almost died um, because of that trauma. And so it's not just mental health, but the trauma that we all live with. And one thing that people think because maternal mortality has been so sensationalized in TV, you know, you often see, oh, the woman dies when she gives birth. But the most dangerous period for women is that postpartum period. And I don't think we've done enough in the postpartum period. But from the mental point for of view? For the mental, yeah. but for physical, I mean, preeclampsia in postpartum is called the silent killer. Um, because a lot of us are not educated. I, you know, I created a mobile app because I remember, you know, in my discharge, you know, I'm sitting there and they're like, okay, great. Two days later, bye, you're on your own. Not, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm a first time mom, I have no idea, and I get this packet of information, and I'm supposed to read all of this and know what danger signs are, instead of someone really involving me in that, in that conversation and, and educating me and seeing yeah. and listening to me, right? Because I, I had those symptoms. They knew when I was leaving that something was not right, right? I didn't want to breastfeed, I, I was having a trouble thinking through things. And then again, I was going home to be isolated. Um, and so, you know, it's hard, but you, you press on, and, but not a lot of people can do that. And we need to rally behind people. For and you've them, actually have been that. collecting up stories of these mm -hmm. women who nearly died, right? Yes, yes. Tell us a little about that. I mean, what are the, some of the stories that you're hearing that have really made an impact on you? Yeah, I think, you know, one, one thing that a lot of people don't hear about is HELP syndrome. And we had one woman who was a black physician from New York City um, who, you know, in her interview, just starts saying, you know, I woke up 10 days later. She was in a coma for 10 days. And when she wakes up, she said she felt heavy and didn't realize not only did she almost die, but her child did pass. Oh, God. Um, and she kept telling, she, she said she was in you know, in labor and, and telling them for a long time, you know, something's not right. You know, I don't know what to do. You know, she didn't want to use her physician card. 
um, to get the attention, but she eventually had to. And then when they ran tests, they were like, oh my gosh, she has HELP syndrome. And that she said that called, was the last called, thing that she heard, HELP syndrome. HELP syndrome? What, what is, I don't understand what that is. Yeah, it's a, a, it's, it's a complicated. I'm, I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't explain it very well. Um, but it, it, it does involve things related to um, you know, high blood pressure and hypertension and stuff. Oh. Amazing. Well, I, what are you doing with that, the, those interviews? So with these stories, they've actually informed a lot of the work, right? Because one thing that we heard in, in pr prior to the work that we were doing was that black women weren't being heard. And so we wanted to, to use narrative-based medicine to amplify and center the lived experiences of black and brown women who almost died near pregnancy. And examining a maternal near miss is a better indicator because we have amazing maternal mortality review committees, but there's so much information that we don't know. And so it's better to hear from women who almost died and figure out points of intervention. And that's where we realized in our center that we really had to take a life course approach on how we do our work. And so even the reproductive justice issue of infertility all the way to one year postpartum. And it's informed a respectful maternity care simulator that we developed. It's informed a community-based perinatal patient navigation program that we developed where we now received an R01, NIH R01 award to test the clinical effectiveness of that in a clinical and a safety net setting. Um, it's informed really, it's been the basis of a lot of the work we do because we really believe in centering lived experiences and we want to respect that black women's voices are legitimate sources of data. We don't need all of these surveys. We just need to listen to people who haven't been heard for a very long time. But if they can't get to doctors, if there is no hospital that, that will listen to them, how are they going to get any of this care? Yeah, so we've been innovative with telemedicine approaches. As I mentioned, with our community-based perinatal patient navigation program, we train people with lived experiences as community health workers, as patient navigators, as doulas, and as lactation peer support specialists. And it's not to replace a physician because having that care, particularly if you're a high risk pregnancy, is really important. So I don't want to negate that. But it provides that cushion for you to be able to be referred to treatment or, or get to the care that you need and provide a lot of that social support that a lot of us lack during pregnancy and in the postpartum period. Now, how are they going to get to you? I mean, it's like these women very often are very isolated and they're not necessarily particularly tech savvy. Mm -hmm. uh, how are they going to find you? I mean, this is an obviously an amazing resource. Yeah, it's an amazing resource. Um, we put them in areas where there are maternity care deserts, and so that is our focus. Um, in Georgia, we have about 60% of our counties lack any type of maternity care provider. Um, and so that was really important for us to figure out ways. We've also developed rural OBGYN residency program, um, which will be, I think, the fourth in the country where our providers will be trained in rural settings. And then looking at family physicians, who a lot of them do practice in rural areas, to be trained in obstetrics and gynecology. And that's just the clinical part. But then building and diversifying the perinatal workforce you know, we're, you know, advocates of, you know, midwives, you know, which midwifery is just such an amazing, I mean, both of my births were with um, certified nurse midwives, and I had the most amazing birth experiences. And I know that I'm here today because of my clinical care team who cared enough to listen to me and provide that support and doing it in a respectful way, in a loving way, and just really caring way. Well, I know that you've just got a grant, right, a big grant for maternal health at Morehouse. And how, how do you plan to spend uh, those funds? Right? Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, one of the things that we learned with the new Maternal Mortality Review Committee reports is that um, there's been an increase in pregnancy, you know, deaths related to mental health and substance use disorders. And so we wanted to focus this center on working on those issues, but particularly focused on black women. Um, oftentimes, black women experience mental health conditions at twice the rate of white women, but are of, often underdiagnosed or not diagnosed at all. Um, black women are less likely to be screened for mental health disorders, and they're less likely to be referred to treatment for these mental health disorders. Um, and this came out of a miniature study I did years ago 
where in this small area of Atlanta, we found 70% of black women to report that they were experiencing some type of mental health challenge. It's and that was tough. just what catapulted us to really focus on this. And again, listening to, new, listening to the community on what they needed. I think, you know, having, you know, the COVID experience elevated a lot of these mental health challenges that our communities were experiencing, as well as the dual, and I call it the dual pandemics of the racial reckoning as well. Oh. Well, I think um, it's, it's fascinating, shocking, you know, upsetting, uh, but really wonderful to see how tenaciously and uh, creatively you're actually addressing all of these things. Yes, thank you. So I'm thrilled that you could be here to talk to us. Thank you so today. much, Tina. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, now, after this, we're going to go uh, in a minute uh, to talk about innovations in maternal health, <laughs> how tech has, you know, can be involved in these solutions with Dr. Wendy Wilcox after this short video. Thank you. Thank you. cool and, and uh, dazzling, actually, at all of that tech that you've just showed us. So it's, it's my great pleasure now to welcome Dr. Wilcox. She's the Chief Women's Health Officer at uh, NYC Health and Hospitals, nation's largest municipal health system with 11 hospitals and 30 health centers. In her distinguished career, she's designed and put in place some of the best practices for maternal health care which serve as models nationwide. Welcome, Dr. Wilcox. Thank you so much for having Great me. Great to have you. Um, why do you think maternal mortality is getting worse instead of better? There are so many reasons for that. We just came out of the COVID outbreak, so those certainly will raise our numbers. We know when we had the bird flu, we saw a blip in that. So certainly infection is that. We know, we just heard from Dr. Hernandez that mental health disorders are on the rise. We know that people are stressed and anxious coming out of the pandemic. And that is also true for our postpartum and our uh, peripartum patients. And so um, for a myriad of reasons, we know that we have to really address this problem head on and from all aspects. We have been dealing with a system a health system that doesn't fit the needs of all of the people it needs to help, right, um, in America. And so we really need to think about redesigning our health system so that it can better fit the needs for all of our patients. I mean, to put it mildly, but that's a major, <laughs> that's an ambition that has defeated many. So obviously, uh, you know, you're having to also sort of narrow down that massive cosmic goal that I think we all share. What are some of the advances that you're using um, for training doctors in maternal health? Well, thank you for asking that question. So we just saw a brief video on virtual reality simulation. Simulation um, is a big part of how we train our doctors. In 2018, New York City Health and Hospitals received a large grant from the city of New York to address maternal mortality. And uh, simulation was certainly a big part of an overall program um, that really was very multifaceted. So in our simulation program, we wanted to take the evidence that was out there 
and use the best evidence to address some of the top causes of maternal mortality. At that time, uh, this is back in 2018, severe obstetric hemorrhage was certainly one of them. Sorry, severe obstetric hemorrhage? Hemorrhage. hemorrhage. Yeah. So postpartum bleeding, bleeding that is not normal after the birth of a baby. It could also happen, it can happen uh, after a vaginal delivery or it can happen after cesarean delivery. The uterus doesn't contract as one expects that it should. And there are a, me there are a series of measures that we need to take as healthcare providers to try to get that uterus to contract and therefore stop bleeding and stop blood loss. And I mean, so what are the, so how does this tech innovation help with that? I mean, so you're doing the virtual simulation. What are you showing? Right, well, I wanna take a step back a little bit. So when we're building the simulation program, we have two types of simulations. We have in-person simulation and we've extended it to virtual reality. I'm gonna talk about both of them. So in our in-person simulation, we build a course, um, we do team training, so it includes the entire team, not just our physicians, our midwives, our nurses, residents training, and we really want to have everyone know their role when a, an event happens that isn't what we would expect. So it's a rare event, but it can be life-threatening and catastrophic. And the whole point of simulation is to practice in, you know, not the acute scenario so that, um, so that y your blood pressure might be a little bit lower, you're a little bit calmer, and hopefully you can think about what steps you need to do to address this when it's not a life-threatening situation. People can practice. The thing that sometimes hampers in-person simulation is that you have to plan a lot of times around the schedules of the providers. So if things are busy on the labor floor or it's the middle of the night or whenever, it may be difficult to get the whole team together to really enact that. We want everyone to go through this training. So the wonderful thing about virtual reality is that one person can train by themselves. Wow. Yeah. So That's you, incredible. It is, it is. I had never put on a pair of goggles until we developed our virtual reality simulation. I was like, whoa, this is what, this is what the kids were talking about. <laughs> so um, so we, we put a, um, a lifelike scenario um, and you know, to back up, providers, when you're, when you're launching a simulation, we do the didactic teaching first. So maybe a grand round or you have people read something you assess their knowledge base, um, you develop the course so that people will then do the actions that you want them to go through when faced with the situation. And so then what you're doing by the simulation in a safe environment, so people feel safe to engage, it's not punitive, you don't want anyone to feel badly if they don't do what, they, you know, what you'd like them to do. You want people to practice and get it hardwired so that when these never events do happen, they can then give you the right course of action that you want. And one of the neat things that we did, um, because we have such a diverse patient population, um, for both our in-person and in the virtual reality space, we built our patients to look like the patients we serve. So we were the first um, hospital, hospital system in the country to get black high fidelity mannequins that's what we use for our in-person simulations. And um, in the virtual reality space, we worked with another company and we said, hey, we'd like you to build this so that it reflects the patients that we serve. And so we have our patient, we built the scenario so that there's a partner in the room, you have the team there. And unfortunately, with the virtual simulation part, you don't necessarily feel what you're doing, but the room is so lifelike, you, you can't walk around because you might actually walk into a wall with the goggles on because you can't see. Um, but you are asking for certain interventions to be done and then um, the figures in the, in the scenario will do them. And it must take a lot of the anxiety and stress out so that at least when it's in the real situation, they know 
they understand this is happening and I need, I need to act. True. How, how long has this been in place and have you seen any result? That's so we've been building our simulation program since 2018. We've got a core team at our flagship site, which is at Jacoby Medical Center. Um, we used to, we actually launched our first course in 2012, that was for shoulder dystocia. That's when the shoulders get stuck and unfortunately it creates a dangerous situation for the baby. It took us three years to train everyone in our health system because everyone had to leave their hospitals and travel to this one hospital and spend at least four hours to train. So for one course, it actually took us three years to get everyone in the health system involved with um, maternal care to get trained. So in 2018, we, with some of the funding, we built simulation mini labs at six of our trauma centers so that the training can happen where- On the, site. Actually, ex exactly, mm -hmm. on site. And, um, and so we have um, trained individuals who are part of each department who are in charge of simulation for that department. And they work very closely with this core team uh, that is professionally trained in simulation as well as their disciplines who then go out and help train the train It's the staff. very cutting edge, isn't it? It really is. It um, actually is. <laughs> so we know that the continuum of maternal care is so important as, as uh, Dr. Hernandez was talking about, you know, the, the post, uh, uh, postnatal, et cetera. Tell, tell us about the sort of the wraparound program that you've uh, helped to launch. Oh, sure. Thank you for asking. So at the same time we launched the simulation program, we launched something called our maternal home. And our maternal home is um, a virtual home. It's not an actual geographic location. Um, in, each in, our, in each of our acute sites, we have um, either a coordinator and or a social worker who is tied with the maternal home program who um, receive patients through referrals. And the home was really meant to um, capture patients or women who may have, um, who are at risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes. Those risk factors may be due to social determinants of health. Um, they may be due to behavioral health and or they may be due to actual clinical conditions. And we all know that we, healthcare is very complicated. We have all these complex healthcare systems, and we really need to help patients navigate them. Well, I was going to say, how do people find you? I mean, you say about referrals, but half of them don't so even the have any. So the wonderful thing <laughs> is that those maternal home teams are in our sites. So um, if I see someone who I'm like, you know, something doesn't seem quite right, or I just want, I, I sense uh, that she may need a little extra help and evaluation, I can refer her to the maternal home. They will take her from me right there um, and speak to her. They run her through um, standardized assessments. Um, risk tiering does go on. We found out about a third of our patients risk at either a moderate or high risk um, level. And then there are interventions from there. Um, since the program launched in um, 2019, um, our teams have done over 10,000 referrals oh. to um, care both within our health system and also outside of it. And it's having an impact. It is having an impact. Um, one of the interesting things, and this touches on what Dr. Hernandez was talking about, is from 2021 to 2022, we saw a 200% increase in referrals for behavioral health mental health services. Mm -hmm. So that really does talk to our need for um, increased access to mental health services for this population. Is, is that, do you think, because of the COVID? I think COVID had a lot to do with mm -hmm. it, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, I mean, we read that really horrific story just the other day about an oncologist here in New York who killed herself and a four-month-old baby with postpartum depression. So how are you, identifying and making sure those women get to you because you know they've been through the whole process they've had their child and then it's so easy for them to fall off a cliff so one of the things about maternal mortality you know now uh through the cdc's um in, uh, you know new uh program we are looking at deaths up to one year post delivery of a baby 
and about one third of the deaths do happen between days 43 up to a year postpartum. So you're absolutely correct. So I think in those situations, we will know some people, but we may not know everyone. So we are actually launching um, virtual express care. That already exists for primary care, but we're actually gonna launch virtual express care for uh, behavioral health and for our postpartum women so that at any time, 24 seven, they can have a hotline to call um, if they really are having a problem and reach a provider and speak to them and then we'll triage from there and get them into care. So when they leave the hospital, having had the child, they're given a number and say, call this, right? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, so, I mean, what do you think is the single biggest change that the uh, US healthcare system needs to make to ensure that all women, <laughs> sorry, it's not meant to be a leading question, but. <laughs> that is. <laughs> yes. Quite loaded. You know, um, we really need to ensure that patients have access to care. I think in the places where there are maternity deserts, that is incredibly dangerous. Um, patients should not have to drive hours just to get to a healthcare provider. Um, things, unfortunately, in pregnancy can happen in the drop of a dime. And that was one of the reasons why we're doing the simulations, because when they do, you don't really have time to react. You have to go into the care mode that you need to go into. Things are happening when patients are at home. So we've got to have um, a scalable level of response at every level and every area so that patients can um, get you know, taken to the care that they need and deserve. Well, Dr. Wilcox, we could talk a long time. I know. I, I mean, as to you and, and to Dr. Hernandez, but I feel that we've begun to hear about some of the complexities of these issues and how incredibly important it is that we keep these conversations alive and the action moving along. So I'm so grateful that we have two extraordinary women like Dr. Hernandez and, and Dr. Wilcox who are spending their lives and time trying to help this crisis on, on the most granular and uh, also in a, in a very sort of aspirational way. It's, it's very, very uh, humbling for us all to hear the kind of work that you're doing. And um, you know, thank you also very much to Philips and to the Washington Post for putting this evening together uh, and to the viewers on Washington Post Live for joining us. Uh, this concludes our conversation part of the evening, but I hope you will now have other conversations at your tables uh, and we can reflect on what we heard and enjoy some networking this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.